Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. We begin with the words of Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. Be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love. Because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins. Wash away all my evil and make me clean from sin. I recognise my faults. I'm always conscious of my sins. I have sinned against you, only against you, and done what you consider evil. So you are right in judging me, you are justified in condemning me. I have been evil from the day I was born, from the time I was conceived I have been sinful. Sincerity and truth are what you require. Remove my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sounds of joy and gladness, and though you have crushed me and broken me, I will be happy once again. Close your eyes to my sins and wipe out all my evil. Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Give me again the joy that comes from your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see everything because you see into our hearts. You understand all the decisions that we make, both good and bad. You wait for us to come to that same understanding ourselves and turn back to you when we have got it wrong once again. It takes us so long to learn to live your way and the minute we think we understand something, the next minute confusion rules again. Forgive us, Lord, for the things we have done wrong, for the thoughts, words and deeds that are unworthy of you. Forgive us for confusing and hurting other people when we put our own wants before their needs. Help us to live your love in our lives without the need to measure ourselves against the world, knowing that you have a higher standard set by Jesus our Lord, who told us to reach for the things that last forever. Wash our hearts clean so that we may try again to reach beyond our own wants and be content with what we need and blessed by all the rest that you have given us of faith, hope, love of a journey to follow we ask your blessing on all those who are worshiping you at home or are we on holiday may they all find the same blessing of your presence and we ask that in this space of worship there might be peace and renewal and forgiveness and hope in worship we offer to you our whole selves as we are ready to be formed by you into a pattern of service and love in every day to come. May your holy name be praised and honoured in all that we think, say and do, now and forever. Amen. Let's listen for God's word. Our first reading today comes from the second book of Samuel, chapter 11, beginning at verse 26 and reading into chapter 12. This follows on from the story of what David had done in order to marry Bathsheba. When Bathsheba heard that her husband had been killed, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to the palace. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the Lord was not pleased with what David had done. The Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David. Nathan went to him and said, There were two men who lived in the same town, one was rich and the other poor. The rich man had many cattle and sheep, while the poor man had only one lamb, which he had bought. He took care of it, and it grew up in his home with his children. He would feed it some of his own food, let it drink from his cup and hold it in his lap. The lamb was like a daughter to him. One day a visitor arrived at the rich man's home. The rich man didn't want to kill one of his own animals to fix a meal for him, Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared a meal for his guest. 
David became very angry at the rich man and said, I swear by the living Lord that the man who did this ought to die for having done such a cruel thing. He must pay back four times as much as he took. You are that man, Nathan said to David. And this is what the Lord God of Israel said. I made you king of Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives and made you king over Israel and Judah. If this had not been enough, I would have given you twice as much. Why then have you disobeyed my commands? Why did you do this evil thing? You had Uriah killed in battle. You let the Ammonites kill him. Then you took his wife. Now in every generation, some of your descendants will die a violent death because you have disobeyed me and have taken Uriah's wife. You sinned in secret, but I will make this happen in broad daylight for all Israel to see. I have sinned against the Lord, David said. We read from the New Testament, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I urge you then, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one Spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all people, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him, he gave gifts to people. Now what does he went up mean? It means that he first came down to the lowest depths of the earth. So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who gave gifts to people. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people, who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under his control, all the parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when the separate parts work as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. And finally, we read from John's Gospel in chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. When the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into those boats and went to Capernaum looking for him. When the people found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Teacher, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I'm telling you the truth. You're looking for me because you ate the bread and had all you wanted not because you understood my miracles. Do not work for food that spoils. Instead, work for the food that lasts for eternal life. This is the food which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has put his mark of approval on him. So they asked him, what can we do in order to do what God wants us to do? Jesus answered, what God wants you to do is to believe in the one he sent. They replied, what miracle will you perform? so that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, just as the scripture says he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I'm telling you the truth, Jesus said. What Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the real bread from heaven. 
For the bread that God gives is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they asked him, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. To his name be praise and glory. We human beings are materialists. We cannot help it because we are beings with bodies and those bodies have need of food and water, clothes and comfort. We need so much to allow us to grow and to become all that we can be. We need enough to live on and enough to look forward to. But we never trust that there will be enough. Just about all the ills of this world have come about because humanity does not trust that there will be enough for all of us. Rather than limit our numbers upon the earth and in, we instead our needs increase our share of everything. When we fear that there is not enough for everyone on earth, we plan for making sure that there's enough for ourselves and those whom we love and we become selfish. War comes from the fear that there will not be enough. We have failed to learn the lessons of faith and trust and we have not learned the lessons of the past yet. Now the whole human race is facing an existential crisis as we struggle for vaccines against COVID-19 and work out how to share them and we look for land that's safe for climate change Ideologies of justification for greed and the continuation of the status quo are everywhere around us. Yet maintaining the status quo is impossible without drowning half the world in rising tides and floods and letting some more of it burn in the ashes of wildfire. COP26 is coming to Glasgow in the next few months. And this conference needs to be revolutionary in its scope and meaning if humanity wants to stop the threat of climate change. And for it to be revolutionary, there would have to be a revolution in the thinking of ordinary people. A revolution of the sort that happened to King David when Nathan came to visit him. David had done something incredibly dishonest and dastardly. He had lost all sense of perspective. He had forgotten that needing and wanting are not the same thing. For he had seen Bathsheba bathing on the roof. And what on earth was she doing having a bath on the roof? She was Uriah's wife. And so David made arrangements to have her husband bumped off in battle. David already had more wives than any one man could cope with. More honour than anyone in his country, more power than any king before him. Yet when he saw Bathsheba bathing, he lost his sense of honour and decency. He thought he'd got away with his devious plan too, for Uriah died. And after the mourning period, Bathsheba was installed in the palace with him. And all was well with the world of the king. The prophet Nathan was sent to speak truth to power. Never an easy task, especially in a time when the messenger was as likely to be killed for the message as anything else. So Nathan was too clever to approach David with criticism straight away. It was obvious to the prophet that David did not realise what he had done. So deeply was he embroiled in his feelings for Bathsheba. Nathan told him a story as if it were something that had happened down in the streets of Jerusalem. The story of the poor man's lamb touched the king's heart and he wanted to go and deal with the wrong immediately. Instead, Nathan showed him that he, David, was the man. That his behaviour over Bathsheba was not only wrong, it was a wrong that was shouting from the rooftops 
because everyone knew what he had done. David, in horrified recognition, said, I have sinned against the Lord. How could it have gone so far without David, the faithful servant of God, realising what he had done? How many of us have not recognised our own wrongdoing until someone has pointed it out to us? In our day and age, it can be a long time and a long way down the road before we hit any sort of critical barrier, before anyone tells us to our face what they think about what we are doing. For we don't like to criticise, and although we may gossip, we are less likely to criticise someone face to face. There's also a fear of criticising those in power. So it took guts for Nathan to go to David, guts and anger, no doubt. Nathan had supported David's kingship, and David had disappointed him deeply with his behaviour. It was a sign of David's continuing wish to serve God that he realised the sin when Nathan pointed it out, and his first thought was that it was God that he had sinned against, echoing those words of Psalm 51. I hope he went on to remember Uriah too. David was about to learn that his power had limits, a lesson all leaders need to learn, for no one is beyond the laws of God, and nothing done by any of us is unnoticed by God. There is nowhere to hide from God. But all too many of us manage to hide from our own behaviour for far too long. Far too many of us manage to reduce the meaning of our lives down to the material alone and leave the spiritual out of it. But sin causes injury to our own spirit as well as hurt to those who are on the receiving end of our behaviour. Confusing need and want is the true original sin. All the way through the theology of the Bible, we find this lesson again and again, that God the Creator has provided for all of us in every situation and wants us to trust in that provision. But human beings do not trust, at least not all the way. The Israelites tried to save the manna they were provided with in the wilderness and it went off overnight. They did not trust that there would be more in the morning. David did not trust that God would provide a wife he loved. So he took someone else's. And in our New Testament reading, the people surrounding Jesus did not trust that God would provide their daily bread. They wanted Jesus to stay and break bread miraculously every day so there would always be enough to stop them worrying about where their next meal was coming from. They confused the physical and the spiritual, just as many of them before and since have done. Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. You're looking for me because you ate the bread and had all that you wanted, not because you understood my miracles. Do not work for food that spoils. Instead, work for the food that lasts for eternal life. The people around him wanted a miracle to prove what he'd said. They wanted the manna like the Israelites had had in the desert. They wanted physical sustenance and security. But Jesus wanted their trust in God, not in miracles that were signs, not proof. Faith does not need miracles. But it does need full commitment from the believer to live that faith into the world without giving in to the confusion between want and need. To live in trust. In our time there's an epidemic of mistrust going on. Throughout the pandemic and before it, many people find it difficult to believe in the goodwill of our leaders and governments. People have struggled to know who to believe and who to trust. Excuse me. <coughs> P- 
People have struggled to know who to believe and who to trust through changing and dangerous times. This is why everything in our politics seems so adversarial. We are all like Nathan, going carefully into the presence of power to enlighten the powerful people that they may be in the wrong sometimes, as we all can be. If there is one thing that's certain about human beings, it is our common need for forgiveness. We all get things wrong. We all confuse need and want. We all reach for more security, even when we don't need it. We are all apt to put our needs and those of the people we love before others and forget that on the earth we are all one family of God's creation. We're all tempted to leap to judgment on others before we recognise that the same accusations could be levelled at us. Jesus came to change the consequences of our mistakes. David knew he had sinned first and foremost against God who had given him so much already. He had wanted more and forgotten to be grateful for what he already had and this is the root of getting it wrong. When we forget to be grateful for what we already have. Jesus taught, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Faith is learning to live this teaching, not to store things for the future, but to use what we have for the good of others every day trusting that God will provide. On the way through the wilderness, there was manna for the children of Israel. For those of us on our way to a future form of church, there will also be sustenance, enough for every day. But we cannot pack it for the journey, for like the manna, it's not meant to be stored up, but used to fuel every day's journey. Here is where faith collides with our human nature and with the nature of every creature who stores up food for a long winter ahead, and everyone who plans for the future and invests for their pension. How are we to square the teaching of Jesus with a sense of future planning? I don't think we are meant to. Instead, I think we are meant to trust in the teaching of Jesus and to live generously with what we have to remember the disasters of David and think that we too could easily fall into the sin of distrusting God's knowledge of all that we need. The material things of life are necessary, but they are only held in their correct place when the spiritual teaching of Jesus rules our hearts, when we reach beyond the everyday material need to the spiritual fuel that is the love of God which provides for us every day. If David had been thinking with this spirit, he would not have sent Uriah to his death in a battle. If we are thinking with our spirits, we will trust God to guide us on the road ahead and through all the change that we face. If we can trust God, we can live without fear of that change knowing that Jesus gives us the bread of life and that we have all that we need in order to follow him into the future. Amen. Let us pray. Bread of life, you give us all that we need. Help us to be content with what we need and to love the beauty of the earth shared without greed. We pray that you will bless the preparations being made for COP26 so that a whole world can pledge to work together, to back down from the tipping points of climate change, to move away from greed for more to a point of sustainable being that leaves room for all your creatures and for all the beauty that you have made. We ask you to bless the eco warriors and the scientists, the politicians and all of us in between, trying to find a way to live sustainably. May our hopes and prayers be answered 
in ways that will make a difference and reduce the danger for those who have least, who are on the edge of destruction by fire and flood. We pray for all who are trying to put an end to the pandemic, with research, with vaccination, with regulation and guidelines for safety. And we pray for those who are leading us through these days in the church and in our nations and world. May there be clarity, goodwill and honesty. We pray for the land of Afghanistan, now plunged into war with the Taliban once more, asking your blessing on its people and for peace to come to them all. We pray for all places where war threatens and chaos destroys peace, in Syria, in Myanmar, in Ethiopia, everywhere that there is terror and fear. We pray for a growing understanding of what this whole world of people and creatures need in order to flourish, a growing willingness of human beings to be part of the sustainable solution in months and years to come. May we listen to the needs of the whole world instead of fulfilling the wants of small parts of it. Blanket us with the wisdom of your loving forgiveness that allows us all to start again, we pray. In the holy name of Christ our Lord, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Go now in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>